Okay, this is the first hour of physics 1C for December 6th. And I think last time what we did was we talked about RLC circuits and we did, I think, one problem, maybe two problems related to them. And so I wanted to do another one. And uh, this is it. This is from the textbook. And it's pretty similar to a problem we already did, but I, I think it helps to just do more. And then we'll talk about transformers. And then after that, we'll talk about electromagnetic waves or plain electromagnetic waves. Okay, so we have an LRC series circuit. Just to remind you, that's a circuit where you've got a resistor, an inductor, the order makes no difference, a capacitor. So we've got R, L, C. And then we connect these up to an AC voltage source where we say that the line current, we define that I of T to be equal to some I max cosine of omega T. And we learned with these circuits, there's this thing called impedance that we can define by taking the square root of R squared plus XL minus XC whole squared where these quantities, XL and XC, are found by doing this. And that's pretty much most of what we learned last time. And then, of course, the fact that we can find, um, you know, RMS voltage or maximum voltage, whichever one we want, by taking um, the current and multiplying by the impedance Z and some other things like the power was equal to, uh, was IRMS, VRMS, cosine phi, where cosine phi was given by taking resistance divided by impedance. And I think that covers most of what we, what we learned about AC, LRC circuits in the last lecture. And so here's a problem that we can solve using these ideas. An LRC series circuit draws 220 watts, so that's power. It's going to be average power. I forgot to mention that this is average power here. Uh, average power of 220 watts. It's average because it has to be averaged. Otherwise, the power would be high and then low and then high and then low, depending on when the current was maximum or at zero. So that's why we time average it over one period. Uh, from a 120 volt, it tells us that's RMS, 50 hertz AC line. So that means that we know that VRMS is 120 volts, similar to the voltage that comes out of your wall. Uh, the frequency is 50 hertz. I think in the United States, the frequency is usually 60 hertz. Um, the power factor is 0.56. Uh, if you remember, power factor, PF, or whatever you want to use for that, is just cosine phi. And cosine phi is equal to 0 0.56. It also says that the source voltage leads the current. The source voltage leads the current. Now, something that I didn't teach you last time, but now that we know all the things that we know, is there's a... Uh, there's like this, I guess you call these a mnemonic device. Eli the Ice Monster. It's the way that I remember it at least. And uh, the way that this mnemonic works is that in a circuit that is primarily um, an inductive circuit, then E leads I, or the voltage leads the current in a inductive circuit. For a circuit in which it's more capacitive than inductive, then the current is going to lead the EMF when the capacitance is bigger. So pretty much what this one refers to is when XL is greater than XC, and this refers to when XC is greater than XL. So we say it's inductive L, so Eli. E leads I. So what's happening here? It says that the source voltage leads the current. Okay. 
So E leads I, right? Which means which of these two is going to be true in this problem? Is it going to be this one or this one? If it says that the source voltage leads current, which one? Which which of these two categories are we in now? Are we in the left one or the right one? The left one, right? Because it says voltage leads currents, EMF leads current, same difference, right? So that means we know in this problem that this is true. We know that XL has to be greater than XC, right? Okay. That also means that phi is greater than zero because tan phi is equal to XL minus XC over R. Okay, so first question, now that we've written all this information down, what is the net resistance R of the circuit? The net resistance R of the circuit, how can we figure that out? Any ideas? We want to find R. Is net resistance Z? No, it's not. Z is impedance. And when they say resistance R, they just mean resistance. Impedance is a type of like generalization of resistance in a weird way. But it's um, when they say net resistance, they, they want to know exactly. They want to know this, basically. They, they want you to find the resistance R. Is there any way we can find that out or find something that would help us to find it out uh, using the equations in the upper right there? R cos phi times Z. Okay. We definitely have cosine phi. It's right here. But what's Z? How are we going to find Z? Can we find it? One other piece I left out is that if you have the maximum values, you can find the RMS values by just finding the root two. Vmax over Imax, yeah, that seems like that would work. This equation is also true if we replace Vmax and Imax with VRMS, because it doesn't change anything. So if we write VRMS over IRMS, that should be equal to Z. But do we have IRMS? I see VRMS, I don't see IRMS. How can we find that one? From average power, that's right. From our equation up here, from average power, we can see that IRMS should be equal to average power divided by VRMS cos phi. Right? Um, because we might need this later. I don't know if we do or not, but often we do. Let's actually just calculate what it is. So average power was 220 watts divided by VRMS, which is 120 volts. And we multiply by cosine phi, which was 0 0.56. And we get IRMS then. I got 3.273, so this is 3.27 amps. And then we find Z from here, which again, we might need that later, so we might as well go ahead and calculate it. Normally when, when, I'm, when we're doing any kind of physics problem, I always say you should solve everything in terms of symbols first and then plug everything in at the end. But these are, our RLC circuit problems are a little different because you commonly just need these quantities, Z and I, we might need them later. So let's just, it can be valuable to do this. So we've 
already knew that the RMS was 120 volts. That goes in the numerator. IRMS of 3.27 amps in the denominator. So if we do 120, oops, 120 divided by 3.27, we're going to get 36.7 is Z. That might be where you can't read it, so put it right here. 36.7. And the unit for this is, of course, ohms. Okay, so we've got IRMS, we've got Z. We're not even done yet because our goal was to find part A. What is the net resistance R of the circuit? So for part A right here, and I think what I'm going to do actually is just zoom out so we can get some more room to work with. So part A, uh, as was originally stated, R should be equal to Z times the cosine of phi, which is coming from that equation there. So if we do that, we get R is equal to Z was 36.7 ohms multiplied by cosine phi, which is 0.56. So we're gonna get that R is equal to 65.5. That's part A. Hopefully no one has any questions. Seems like you all were able to figure out pretty quickly how you do it. We're just manipulating these equations until we're left with one unknown. All right, part B, find the capacitance of the series capacitor that will result in a power factor of unity when it is added to the original circuits. And then we have to find what power will then be drawn from the supply line. So find the capacitance of the series capacitor that will result in a power factor of unity when it's added to the original circuit. So we've done this, before. we did this in the last problem that we did at the end of class last time, but let's look at it again. So the idea is if we take our circuit and we add in a new capacitor here, we'll call it capacitor C prime. So this was C L R. The effect will be that when I put a capacitor in series, the new capacitance, the equivalent capacitance, CEQ, for series capacitors is 1 over C plus 1 over C prime to the negative 1. The effect will be that the capacitance of the circuit afterwards is going to be smaller. But when the capacitance gets smaller, if we look at this equation here, XC gets bigger. And when XC gets bigger, we can probably make it so that XL minus XC is zero, which will make phi zero, which will give us a power factor of unity, right? So PF equal to one means cosine of phi has to be equal to one, which means that phi is equal to zero. But if phi is equal to zero, when we look at this other equation that I just pointed to that says that tan phi is equal to xl minus xc over r, if this is equal to tan of zero, well, the tan of zero is sine of zero over cosine of zero, which is zero. So if we put this equal to tan zero, then we have the whole thing equal to zero. And the only way the whole thing can be equal to zero is if xl is equal to xc. All right. And this is going to be like XCEQ, effectively, the equivalent capacitance, right? So the goal is you add another capacitor in, it makes the overall capacitance smaller, but by making C smaller, you make XC bigger. And in this particular problem, we had said that XL was greater than XC, so in order to get zero out of our tan phi, we need to make XC larger. And we can figure out how large it needs to be by using this equation here. Be Wait a minute, can we though? We don't know what L is, right? And I don't think we can find L or C, right? Would you all agree? Can we find L or C? What do you think? Maybe I'm maybe I'm crazy and I'm just uh, not not thinking hard enough. Could we find X L or X C, or equivalently? L or C with the given information. Mm -hmm. 
Yes or no? What do you think? That's right, Michael, yeah. We could get the Radiance per second from Hertz so we could find Omega. But in order to find XL or XC, we would need to know one of them. Because they always show up together in all of the formulas. Right? Well, there's only one formula. It's right here. So since they show up together in that formula and they show up together in this formula, the only thing we could actually calculate is this quantity. We can find, we can figure out what XL minus XC is, right? So, our goal is to make them equal to each other by adding a new capacitor in here. And all we know is what XL and XC are. But what I would argue is that after we put another capacitor inside of here, right, what's going to happen is we're going to have something like this. By putting our new capacitor in there, we're going to have XL minus the original XC plus the new XC prime right? And this whole thing we need to make equal to zero. Now if we distribute through the negative sign here, before I do that, does this line make sense to you all? Okay, in that case, all we have to do, and I chose this problem because it's pretty similar to the lab manual problem, one of the lab manual problems that you all have, where, in fact, I think the numbers may actually be very close to the same. So you get this, XL minus XC is equal to XC prime. Okay, so this is really nice because we actually can figure out what XL minus XC is, right, from this equation. XL minus XC is equal to R tan phi. Right? And let's open this up a little bit more. XC prime is just one over omega times C prime, which means we find that C prime, the capacitor that we want to add, is just equal to one over omega is two pi times the frequency. And then we have R tan phi. So even though we can't actually figure out what XL minus XC was, we can figure out the kind of capacitor we want to add by just looking at this equation here. So 2 pi, the frequency was 50 hertz. The resistance we calculated here was 65.5 ohms. And then we multiply by the tan of phi. Now for the tan of phi, I'm just going to write this as the tangent of the arc cosine of 0.56, because that's what our power factor was, right? And then I'll just say over here on the left that if cos phi is 0.56, right, that means that phi is equal to the arc cosine of 0.56. And there we go. Sure. I will do that again, no problem. Let me, let's solve this real quick. The tangent of the arc cosine of, and it doesn't matter if I'm in degrees or radians for this because the cosine is gonna be the same. So all of that equals to the negative one power I get 3.3 .3 times 10 to the minus 5. All right, it is 3.28 times 10 to the minus 5. Farads, we'll check the units here in a second. Um, it has to be right there because it's ohm, ohms times hertz down here. And that's the same format of 1 over omega c. So yeah. OK, this would then be, if we wanted to write it in a kind of neater way, we could write it as 32.8 microfarads, and that's C prime. Okay, I'll scroll down a little bit because it looks like that's getting cut off. 
Okay, uh, so that's our answer. And your question was, how did I do this, right? Why is this zero? All right, so um, we said that we are going to add a capacitor in series to our, our problem, right? And we know that the equivalent capacitance when we add a capacitor in series, right, is given by that expression right there. So if we expand that out, one way we could write it is one over CEQ is equal to one over C plus one over C prime. And then what we could do is we could multiply the entire thing by one over omega. And what that would do is the first term would be one over omega CEQ. I would call that X CEQ is equal to one over omega times one over C. I would call that X sub C and one over omega times one over C prime, I would call that omega X sub C prime, right? So what I said was in order to get a power factor of unity, which is what we're going for in this problem, in order for phi to be equal to zero, that means that tan phi also is equal to zero, which is equal to XL minus XC divided by um, R. That's not gonna happen with our original capacitor. It wasn't equal to zero, phi was equal to something else, right? But if I change this to XCEQ, then what we're calculating now is the, the value here, XCEQ, of the total capacitance that will give us a power factor of unity that will make phi equal to zero. And that means that if I multiply R to zero over here, then I get that zero is equal to XL minus XCEQ. But XCEQ is just equal to, from here, XC minus, or XC plus um, XC prime. Does that help you, Evan, to see where it came from? Okay, great. Does anyone else have any questions about this problem? We're not done yet. There is another question that asks. We'll, we'll answer that one too. The final question is, what power will then be drawn from the supply line? Right. Now, the thing that's going to happen now is before we had it, an RMS current of 3.27 amps. But if you look at the way that we calculated that right here, that also involved a power factor. The power factor is now going to be 1, right? The power factor is now going to be 1. But the question is, is it as simple as just taking 220 and dividing by 120? And I think the answer is no. And the reason why is because how did we find I? Well, we found I from these quantities here, right? But now Z is different. Z has changed now, right? Because now this quantity is 0, right? Which means Z is equal to just R. So we need to calculate the new current. And our new current, IRMS, should be equal to VRMS divided by our new Z. But like I said, our new Z is just the resistance of our circuit. So if we take 120 volts and we divide by R, which was 30, no, uh, 65.5. We're going to get, maybe this ends up being the same thing in the long run. Maybe this, I don't know. Our new current is 1.83 amps. So now, our average power now, P average, we can either find by doing IRMS squared times R, or we can find it by doing IRMS times VRMS times cosine of phi, but phi is now 1. So either one of these will work. Um, so if we take 1.83 amps and we square that, is the current now lower or higher? The current, the output current is lower. Okay. So 1.83 amps, and we multiply by 65.5 ohms, we get. It 
looks the same. So something I did must be wrong. Then. Something I did must be wrong. Let's go back and look at the problem. An LRC circuit draws 220 watts from a 120 volt 50 hertz line. The power factor is 0.56 and the source voltage leads the current. What is the net resistance R? We figured that out. Because we found Z. And we found Z by finding I. We found I by doing average power. We divide by this. We get 3.27. Find the capacitance, we did that. That's kind of a separate calculation. So there's the capacitance. What power will then be drawn from the supply line? How do you get the same answer? It has to be different, right? This is an odd problem too, so we can actually look up the answer in the back of the book. Um, what did I do wrong down here? The IRMS should be equal to VRMS over Z. I don't think this would change. Z would definitely just be equal to R. The only other way we would do it would be to just take this out. No, that's not going to work. I mean, the naive way to do it would be to set this equal to 1. And then just solve, but I don't think that's... Maybe the answer is 220 watts. I don't, I don't think it is, though. I think I've done something wrong. You want to see anything that I've done wrong here? What is this? 31.63? Thirty-one point sixty-three. Oh, we got the other part wrong too. So part A, it says, is twenty point six ohms. We got all of it wrong. I must have done. We're gonna have to go back here and figure out what we did wrong here. Let me make sure it's actually the same problem. Thirty-one point sixty-three. Sometimes they change the numbering. Just checking. Looks like the right one. Wow, we got them all wrong. All right, what did we do wrong here? So it draws 220 watts from a 120 volt RMS, 50 hertz AC line. This could just be a calculator error. Oh yeah, I can see it. Can anyone see the error that I made? This one's correct. We know this isn't right. R should be smaller because it's 36.7 multiplied by 0.56. I don't know what I did. I, don't know, I can't tell what I did at all. Actually, I can go back and look, I suppose. But I divided, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so it's 36.7 times 0.56. It would be smaller. 20.552, that is the right answer. Okay, so let's go back and fix this stuff. Okay, so this one should have been 20.56 or 20.6 we could say 20.6 ohms and then when we come down here this r this should also have been 20.6 which is going to change our capacitance 1 divide 2 divide pi divided by 50 20.6 divided by the tangent of the arc cosine of 0.56 equals I get 1.04 times 10 to the negative 4 This would be 104 microfarads. And then when we go back over here and solve for the power, this number here was wrong. So this would be wrong. All of these are wrong. Okay, so it was a different value, so it's 20.6 ohms now. And that will give us about 6, a little less than 6 amps, 5.8 amps. 
then we take that, we do 5.8 times 5.8, and then multiply by our resistance of 20.6. Now what I get is, so this was 5.8. Let's put one more digit on that, actually. 5.83. So then now our average power should be 5.83 amps squared times our resistance, which is 20.6 ohms. So we end up getting... About 700, that is the answer, that's good, okay. Uh, one little one little error could just propagate right through these kind of problems. But I guess it was good that we got the, it's a good thing that we got 220 again, because it showed us that we must have done something wrong. I might not even have noticed if, uh, if our answer had come out to be like 400, I'd be like, yeah, it's bigger, that makes sense. Point is that the, the kind of like moral of the story, so to speak, is, that adding this extra capacitor in series actually increased the output power by a factor of five, I think, right? Is it five times 120 equal to, no, it was 220, 220. So it increased it by a factor of about three, right? So it's 700 divided by 220, yeah, 3.2. So the, the average power now that's being drawn from the system is three times as big just by adding that extra capacitor in there, which I find that's really it's quite interesting. It effectively makes your system kind of more efficient in a way at taking that voltage that comes in, this is your energy that's coming in, and then converting it into something that you can use, which is well, power or current, right? Uh, even the current itself here you can see is bigger than the current before. It was 3.3, it's now drawing 5.83 amps. That could be a problem if the circuit's not able to handle that much current, but it could be a good thing if you're trying to make your system more efficient and um, get more power out of it. So yeah, it is important to understand that nothing is free in the world. So even if you make a system that can take the energy coming from the wall socket and turn it into usable power or usable work, whatever you want to call it, um, more efficiently, what is this, a hairdryer or something like that? It just says it's a circuit, okay. This object, our new circuit that draws 700 watts compared to the original circuit that draw 220 watts means that this one is going to be using up power more quickly, so it's gonna cost more to run. So that's something else important to keep in mind. Okay, so there we go. Anyone have any questions? R should be smaller. Did I make a mistake? Oh, no, 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 that was your answer. Sorry, that was your answer to, to this question here. This should have been, yeah. Okay, uh, next thing we wanna talk about are these, these little things right here. We call them transformers. So let's zoom back in. And I didn't leave, actually here, make a little bit more room. All right, so Last topic from, this is still chapter 31 on alternating circuits, alternating current is transformers. A transformer is basically a device that will <clears throat> either step up or step down voltage in the system. Um, and it's, they're used all over the place. You probably have several of them in your home that you, that are inside of like um, things that you plug into the wall. Let's talk about what they are. So a transformer has the ability to basically step up or step down the voltage coming in from a, from a line. That's what a transformer is. On a power line, what these look like is something like this. You should be able to go outside of your house 
and find something like this somewhere on your street. It may not be like right in your backyard for me. Mine is, I know, kind of back over this direction. There's power lines that run parallel to my street that go this way. And uh, at the top of a lot of those power lines, so here's the power lines, you'll see these cables that come down like this. They go into a little canister that looks like this, little cylind cylindrical canister. And this thing is the transformer. On really hot days, these t sometimes these things will pop and they sound really loud. It's just like a big explosion going off and then someone has to go up and fix them and when they pop, usually the power goes out in your neighborhood. Anyway, have you all seen these kind of things on the top of power lines? These big fat boxes like this? Cylindrical can? They usually circular just like this. Okay, you all have seen these before, okay. So we call this a, trans a transformer and what it does is it takes the voltage that's coming in from um, the, the wires here and I don't, does your book actually put a number? I know when I teach this in uh, my physics 12 class, the book actually gives numbers. I don't know why this book doesn't give numbers unless I'm, because I can't see it, I don't know. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna make up some numbers just based on my memory. I could be a little bit off here. But the idea is that, suppose that I have a, a power plant, okay? Have we talked in this class very much about how power plants work? I think we have, right? Because we learned about generators and we learned that for a generator to work, all you really need is some kind of little coil of wire that's being rotated around a magnet or a magnet that's being rotated around a coil, it works either way. But your power plant is gonna produce power, right? And it's gonna send that power out along a line down to a local substation, which these kind of things you might see, that these are the kind of places where when you go near them, it'll say like danger, high voltage, there'll be like a bunch of uh, fence and then you'll just see, um, a bunch of like electrical power looking things basically, right? These, you might find one of these somewhere in your neighborhood, but probably not too near to your house. Okay, so a power plant produces the power. It sends it down to the substation. And let's say that when the power plant produces the power, it's sending, um, let's say 100,000 volts down the line, okay? Now that's a lot of voltage, right? But the reason why they do this is they send it with high voltage but low current, okay? It's high voltage, but low current. And why do they do that? The reason why they do it is that when I have a long piece of wire like this, when the current is really high, you lose energy due to thermal radiation away from your system. Uh, and that's because if I have a resistor and there's a current I flowing through the resistor, we know that that, dis that resistor dissipates power at a rate of I squared times R. Whether it's RMS current or DC current, it does not matter. It always dissipates this amount of energy, I squared times R. So you can call the losses due to this energy uh, I squared R losses. That's at least the way the textbook and other things talk about it is like, as you're sending current down this wire, the wire has resistance. There's, there's nothing you can do about that unless you use a superconducting wire. And using a superconducting wire means you have to keep it really, really cold, at least with current um, technology. So you're gonna lose energy, right? And if you're a power company, and you're sending power from the power plant to the substation, and you're doing that over a very long distance, right? You know, the power plant could be really far away. The power plant could be the Hoover Dam, for example and you need to send that energy from the Hoover Dam, the falling water over the dam, you need to send that down to Southern California, which some of the energy from the Hoover Dam is used in our electrical grid. So what you wanna do is you send it with really low current because this lowers the amount of losses you get from this equation, right? Because if it's low current, I squared is not gonna be that big. The wires aren't gonna get that hot, right? If it's high current, the wires get really hot and that heat is just lost energy, right? you wanna conserve as much energy as you can. So that's why you send it at high voltage, but low current. It then gets to the substation, which again, it's gonna be somewhere like in your neighborhood, but probably not super close to your house. Homes are not usually built near these things. They're usually like in more industrial parts of your city or your town. And then within the substation is a transformer. And this transformer has the effect of stepping down the current or the voltage. So inside of this, there'll be a step down transformer 
and let's say that it goes from 100,000 volts and now it, it drops it down by a factor of 10 to 10,000 volts. So now we're still at pretty high voltage, but, uh, but still reasonably low current. The current is now going to have to go up, so higher current, um, just because if the voltage goes down, the current is going to have to go up. When we transmit the uh, energy along these lines, we can't violate this rule. The power has to be equal to I times V, right? So if you have a voltage of 100,000 volts, I'm not even going to put numbers in here because I think you can see it from the equation. The point is that if the voltage goes down by a factor of 10, right? If the, vo if the voltage goes down by a factor of 10, the current has to go up by a factor of 10, right? So if the current here was, let's say, 1 amp, what's the current over here now going to have to be? We have to maintain I times V being constant. So before it was 100,000 times 1. Now you have a current that's equal to 10 amps, right? And really, it was probably something like 0.1 amps, and now we're at like 1.0 amps or something like that. You, you get the idea. Even, even this number is pretty high. Okay, so what's the next piece of the line? Well, the next piece is the power poles by your house. So now near your house, you're going to have these power poles, right? They're going to have all these cables. And on one of these, there's going to be a transformer. Right? And this, this line is going to connect up to that, right? And then from there, there's a line that goes from the transformer down to your home. Where now... The transformer's job is to get that power to have a voltage that's equivalent to the voltage that we're used to getting out of the wall socket, which is 120 volts. So we have another step down transformer. So what the transformer is doing, right, is it's just taking high voltage uh, electricity, which is really dangerous, and stepping it down to a usable 120 volts uh, that, we can, that, we, that we can then use to power all of our appliances. Because all of our appliances are designed that when you plug them into the wall, they know they're getting 120 volts. Now, an interesting thing that will happen is that even within your home, okay, there are also going to be further transformers because if you've ever seen, um, I think my cell phone charger, maybe many of your cell phone chargers, I think almost all cell phone chargers have this. Anyway, it doesn't really matter, but if you've ever seen a thing that you plug into the wall that looks like this, where there's this big, fat, almost cubicle box... It's not, it's not usually a cubicle, but it's like a big fat box, right? And it's got the two prongs coming out. Oh, I didn't draw this very well. It's got the two prongs coming out like this that you plug into the, the wall socket, right? And then there's a cable that goes up like this, and they usually have like a little tiny few millimeter jack, right? Like this that you plug into whatever. I I don't know that my current cell phone charger looks like this, but I think everyone who has a cell phone charger, the charger itself, it's not small, right? You know, you don't just have like a single cable that goes into the wall and then a direct line into your into your device, right? You usually have some kind of cubicle box. Would, would, would you all agree with that? Is that true? Yeah, okay. I don't, I don't have my charger sitting on my desk here, but usually, yeah, gaming consoles have it. Exactly. Almost just a ton of things in your home that plug into the wall have these kind of things. Not everything. Like a lamp, when you plug a lamp into the wall... The cable is just a little tiny thing. You, you plug it into the wall, and all it does is it just sends power directly to the lamp, right? Probably the same thing for a lot of other things. I can't think of anything on top of my head. But inside of these devices here, there are also transformers. And if you look on your phone charger, it's going to tell you something about what that transformer does. I'm actually going to go get my phone charger because I'm going to... And if you have a phone charger in your house, maybe go grab it. You can, you can look at it and see if you can find what I'm about to show you. And of course, mine has no information on it. That's too bad. I think I can find one that does have information on it. Oh, is that one? None of these seem to have any... Oh, this one does, okay. Well, 
my god, this is really hard to read. Yeah, okay. This one works. Okay, so the one that I found do all require that's the most that's a very general question. Hey, do you need to um what do you mean by all? Chargers? Uh most of them probably. Okay, so this is one for I think this is for my Nintendo Switch. And it actually says on the side how much of this can you see? If I put this really close, you probably still can't see it, right? I'm just going to look at this real quick. Here. There's no way you can see that, right? There's no way. Anyway, I'll just tell you what it says on the side. On the side, and look at any any kind of charger in your house is probably going to have something like this. Most of them do. It seems like it's all, almost all Apple chargers do. I don't know why the one I found for my phone doesn't, but this says Lucent Trans. I'm sure the trans is probably short for transformer. And what this one says is uh, input 100 to 240 volts at 0.3 amps and 60 hertz frequency. Okay, so it takes in an input of, let's say, 120 volts. It has a range. And then it outputs 5 volts at 2 amps. Okay, so what this charger does is it takes in alternating current and it turns it into DC current. So there's two things that are happening here. One is it's transforming alternating current into DC current. The other thing it's doing is it's transforming um, the high voltage current into lower voltage current. So this one would take in 120 volts and then it would output five, uh, five volts? Five volts. And that's presumably what's needed to charge up the switch, which is what this is for. So if you look on a lot of different devices, you're gonna find those kind of numbers on there. What does yours say? Your mind, yours outputs 5.2 volts at 2.4 amps. Yeah, there you go. So and it also told, from what I read there, it also kind of tells me that the current that comes in here is at 0.3 amps, which means the current coming out here should you know, be proportionally, uh, what, one, what's 120 divided by five or whatever. So the math of how these things work then, man, we're spending a lot of time on transformers here, uh, but they're interesting, so I guess it's not that, uh, the math of how these work is through something like this. Now, before we get into the math, I just want to summarize that what a transformer is doing is it's basically just converting voltage into a form that your device can use. That's it. That's all that they do. And they occur via the step-down process that occurs from a power plant to a substation to your home, but then they also occur in a lot of the devices that you have. So how do they work? How do they magically go from 100,000 volts to 10,000 volts then the answer is through Faraday's law, through through induction. So here is a schematic device, a schematic diagram of a transformer. Okay, and the way that it works is you have a source of alternating current over here. This could be at like your power station or something like this. And those wires for that source are then wound around an iron core. That's what this piece of this uh, kind of rectangular donut um, is it's made of iron. Iron has the effect of enhancing magnetic flux, right? So this one has wires that are wound around here through some number of windings. They call this the primary winding. And the number of turns is in one. In this picture, there's only two turns. Because it comes in here, it wraps, or it wraps around here, and then it goes out there. So there's only two turns here, but you can in principle, and they usually do have many, many, many more turns usually be something like 500 turns or something like that. And then on the other side, wrapped around the exact same iron core, but not electrically connected. So this circuit is disconnected from the circuit on the right. We have another object that has, it looks like four windings that we're gonna call N2 on the secondary winding, right? And then this one is then connected up to a resistor. This resistor could be anything. This could be a toaster. This could be just anything. All right, this is supposed to represent, this is the output. So it's input, power, and then output over here. And what we can say is that Faraday's law of induction tells us that the EMF is equal to the number of turns times d phi dt, right? And there's a negative sign here. 
So let's say that on the left-hand side over here, we have an EMF that we call E1, and it has, this is our source, it has a number of windings in one, okay? And on the right-hand side, that means we're gonna have an induced EMF E2 that's gonna be negative N2 d5 dt, okay? The idea, of course, here is that if this is an alternating current, that means the flux through the iron, the flux through these loops right here, it's gonna be changing. The flux changing here is going to affect the flux through this loop here. And as a result, we can transport, transport's the wrong word, we can induce current from this circuit into this circuit here via Faraday's law, according to this right here. Now, E1 in this case is gonna be our source EMF. So this is the source, as in, in our picture over here, it could be the power plant. So this, this would be like E1. And then E2 could be the power that's coming out of the substation, right? And all you need to do to step down the power is to realize that when we connect these two objects with this single iron core right here, what's gonna happen is that the rate of change of the flux is gonna be the same for both of them, which means we can divide these two equations so that we get E1 over E2 is equal to, what is it gonna be? N1 over N2. Or it could be written as it's written here, okay? So for example, if we use the numbers that I gave you, that E1 was 100,000 volts coming from the power station, and E2 is the current that comes out of the substation of 10,000 volts, well then we know that in order to make that occur, the ratio of N1 over N2 has to be the same as the ratio of the voltage that we want to step down, in this case, 10, okay? So what that means is, unlike the picture over here, the number of turns N1 would need to be 10 times as many as N2, right? So what you would have is you'd have your transformer. I'm just going to draw kind of a side view of it. Over on the left-hand side over here, you'd have a coil that's been wrapped around and around and around and around and around and around and around. You, got, you just keep going until you get, uh, let's say, let's say this is N1. And we say that, let's say we put 100 coils here, right? Well, according to this, 10 times N2, so here's our source. On the other side, not directly connected to this, we then would put just 10 turns. So you just put 10 in here, and the result is that the output on this side is going to be equal to E1 divided by 10, as long as N2 is 10. Did I get that right? Let's see. 10 over 10, 100,000, put a comma in here, divided by 10,000 is 10. So N1 over N2 needs to be 10, and 100 divided by yeah, 10 works out, right? Okay, does that make sense? Do you all have any questions? Yeah, it's really simple. <laughs> it's really simple. You know why it's simple? Because I'm lying to you. It's not this simple. In a physics textbook, it's this simple, but when you, when you go and read about um, what happens in an engineering textbook, what you're going to learn is that the ratio, while this is a good, this is a good first approximation, okay? Just like Newton's law of gravity is a good first approximation. This is a very good first approximation. But what I found is when I go and use the transformers that we have at the school and just do really simple tests, like hook up one, one side of the transformer to a known uh, AC voltage where I know what, like let's say 100 voltage, 100 volts, and then I can count the number of turns. So we have like we have like 10 to 1, 100 to 1. We have a bunch of like 50 to 1. There's all kinds of different combos of like coils that we have at the school. I always found that this equation is a little bit overestimating um, what's going on. And so I did some more research and I found out that it turns out that it's frequency dependent. So the rate at which this is alternating, which in the United States is like 60 hertz, right? that actually also has an effect on this equation. So, you know, I don't always tell you that there's, that, that these equations are lies, but I, I know in particular this one is because I went and did some experiments where I tested. <laughs> it, ne it never quite works. It's close, but it's not that close. So, um, anyway. Um,
Yeah, okay, actually, even in the book they mention that... So this implies 100% efficiency, right? It implies that the transformer... That we don't, we don't lose any energy, okay? The reality is, according to this, it says that uh, transformer efficiencies are usually well over 90%. I don't even believe that. 90%, come on. I guess, it, according to this, at least, it depends on how good the... If you use soft iron... Okay, it says for your charger, the input is 100 to 240. Does that mean I can use my charger in Europe since they use... So the prongs are different. He's right. You can use a, uh, a converter. You have to get a converter to be able to plug into the wall socket. But probably what that means... Okay, and the, the one that I was looking at here a second ago is the same. Close enough, here we go. So this one's the same. It says uh, 100 to 240. My guess is that this same device... It's probably also manufactured with the European prongs, right? Isn't that what you would read that as? But if you want to, you can just get a converter, which allows you to plug this into a European wall socket, where the, the kind of they look a little bit different. But don't you think that means that they probably also manufacture ma manufacture these for Europe, right? Probably the exact same box, but then just on this side, it's just the different prongs. That's what I would think. Why else would it say one whatever two forty? Okay, let's do a problem and let's take a break. Oh, I really didn't think that. Way. What time did we start? We started like two fifteen, right? Or one fifteen, right? Um, oh, did I not copy the problem? That's okay. We can get it real quick. So this is here. This one. We're gonna do this problem. Actually, print screen. Go to paint, paste. I always think I give myself a lot of room with them. Okay. All right, so here's the problem. It says a friend returns to the United States from Europe with a 960 watt coffee maker designed to operate from the 240 volt line. So that's like the voltage in Europe. What could she do to operate it at the standard 120 volts? What current will the coffee maker draw from the 120 volt line? What is the resistance of the coffee maker? The voltages are RMS values. Okay, so coffee maker designed to operate from a 240 volt line. What can she do to operate it at the USA standard 120 volt? So what's the answer to that first part? This part's uh, not intended to be super complicated, but the way that they're asking, it's kind of weird. So the idea is if you want to have something that is 240 volts and you want to get that to 120 volts, right? Then all you need is a transformer. We'll do that for you. And since E1 over E2 should be equal to N1 over N2, then the kind of transformer that you want to work here, that you want to put inside of here, needs to have the same ratio of two to one. So that means that if the 240 volt line, let's say N1 was equal to, let's say 100 turns, then you would need to uh, have N2 be 50 turns. Or it could be two and one, but that's kind of unrealistic. So that's the answer to part A. You need to hook up a transformer. Maybe one side that's connected to the 240 volt side is 100 turns, and then the 120 is connected to 50 turns. Part B says, what current will the coffee maker draw from the 120 volt line? To figure out the current, what we know is that the average power is 960 watts, and it was designed to operate at 960 watts um, with a voltage of 240 volts. So we can use average power is equal to IV. We don't know what the um, power factor is here, so we have that's all we can really go with. So that means we can find what I1 is.
Yeah. I1 is going to be equal to the power, which is 960 watts, divided by 240 volts. What's this? 96. Is 96 8 times 12, and this is 2 times 12, so this is 8 over 2, so is it 4? It could be 4 times 4 is 16 plus 1. Yeah, that looks right. So you get 4 amps. That's what the current is when it was plugged in in Europe. The question is, what's the current now? And what we know is that the power has to be the same, so there's a relationship that we can write down that I1V1 has to be equal to I2V2. So now if we solve for I2, we're going to get I1 over I2 times, nope, that's not how you do that. Okay, I2 equals I1 times V1 over V2. So this is gonna be four amps multiplied by V1, which was, 240 over V2, which is 120. So now I2 is equal to 8 amps. So we're now sending twice as much current through the coffee maker, right? Twice as much current, which is, uh, which could be a problem. It could fry out the system if it's not designed to be able to take on that much current. Uh, finally, it says, what is the resistance of the coffee maker? We can find resistance by just doing Ohm's law, I believe, so that V over I should be equal to R. It should be the same ratio no matter which one we use, so let's just check. So if we use 240 volts and we divide by 4 amps, we're going to get a resistance of 60. And if we did... This can't be the same, can it? 120, wait a minute. Yeah, so if we did uh, 120 and we divided by eight, what's that equal to? 15. That seems weird. What's the right answer? What do you all think? We got everything else right. It says I1 is 8 amps. That's what we got right. And then the secondary current is 4 amps. Oh, there's an equation I didn't give you. This is the right answer. It says you can get the same thing by taking V2, which was 120, and doing power is V squared over R. But why don't you get the same thing if I just do V2 over I2? Shouldn't that work as well? They give, they give a different equation. It seems like you should. I don't understand why. But there's an equation that they give. This is in your textbook. Right after this equation, they give this equation, which says that if you combine... 3135, which is the winding equation, right? So if we basically they're saying if you take this equation and we also include the N1 over N2 is equal to V1 over V2, and then we use, oh, is that the reason why? No, it's not. And then we use um, I2 equal to V2 over R. They're saying combine all of those equations together 
and we're gonna get Ugh. how are we gonna eliminate the ends no the ends are still gonna be there okay so v1 over v2 according to this equation here what do i want to eliminate i want to eliminate all the twos all right so we're gonna get rid of v2 and i2 that's our goal so according to this equation here v2 is equal to i1 over i2 times v1 and we need to eliminate that. So here, n1 over n2 is v1 over v2. So v1 divided by this thing Well, that just eliminates v1, but I think that maybe it's going to come back in. Let's see. How did they do this? All right. I'm wasting a lot of time. There's a lot of stuff we want to do today, and I don't think this is ultimately that important. So I'm going to write down the results and assume that you all can figure it out. I know that I can if I'm not being pressed for time, but this is the result that they get. Except the 2 and the 1 are reversed. Two and the one here are reversed, and they're they're using this to solve this and get the answer for the resistance up here. But uh, I don't really understand what's going on there. Anyway, uh, we're gonna stop there. We're gonna take a break. It's two twenty-two, so we'll take a break until two thirty-two.